Hi everyone, welcome to seminar. I am so happy to introduce Dr. John Warwick. It's good to see you. Good to see you again. Uh, he's a research geologist at the U.S. Geological Survey's mm. Pacific Coastal and Marine Science Center, which used to be called the Western Coastal and Marine Geology Group in Santa Cruz, where I used to work. And uh, he's been there for more than 10 years. He has a bachelor's degree from Cal Poly San Luis Obispo in soil science, a master's in civil and environmental engineering from the University of Wisconsin, and a PhD in marine science from UC Santa Barbara, which makes him uniquely qualified <laughs> to lead this project. This is the largest dam removal in US history and it was so great to work with you on this. It's the Elwha River Dam Removal Project. So his research focuses on how rivers interact with the ocean and in particular how sediment from coastal watersheds can change the physical and biological environment in the coastal zone. So today he's going to be talking about the removal of two large dams on the Elwha River, Washington. I brought him a visual aid. This is a core from one of the dams, which he'll talk more about. I forgot about this. This is great. <laughs> I, how, how, it was this, many years ago I gave you this. Yeah, yeah that's good. Many, many years ago. And I guess I might be the only one holding a core, which I'll have to give back. But it's uh, definitely oh. tell them how white. Sure. You know, I'll, I'll pass this around so people can check it, check it out. But it's, uh, this is a, a piece of a 100-year-old dam right here. Right. It no longer stands. 60s, this was taken by the Army Corps of Engineers? I think so. They were right. doing an investigation of the structural integrity of the dam and left a bunch of these around. Holes. Yeah, by plugging holes, right? <laughs> <laughs> well, this thing was built so long ago, you re they really didn't know what was in it. So, you know, it's like, uh, there's a bunch of stories. I mean, you, yeah. I'm going to give you one last shout out. Okay. His work was re recently featured in the New York Times and National Geographic. We, we all have a couple, a couple seconds of glory, and then we fade into oblivion. Well, Thank, welcome, Dr. Thanks. Jonathan Warwick. Thanks. It's good to see you again. Great to see you again. <laughs> so uh, Elwha is a fantastic story. Um, there's so many ways to tell the story, because there's so much to this. Uh, it's, it's really hard to, to just spend an hour on this. So, uh, and I know Melissa Foley was here last year. Some of you may have s seen her talk, focusing on the ecology, primarily of the estuary. I'm trying to give a little bigger picture today um, and talk about some of the history, uh, especially some of the recent history, and then walk you through a lot of the sediment. Um, I know there's a lot of biologists and ecologists here, but I, hopefully you'll see that the meaning of, of that and why it was so important. Um, so yeah, this is, a, this is a piece of the dam. Um, so this is part of Glines Canyon Dam. And what was so interesting, why I actually picked this up out of the stack, this was just one of many uh, that was left there after this old investigation, was look how much aggregate they used. I mean, I, I am an engineer, but I'm not this type of a civil engineer. But it seems like a lot of aggregate in that and not much concrete. Um, and like I said, there's a lot, I'll pass this around, you can take a look at it. There are a lot of stories. And in fact, one of the stories is the lower dam, Elwha Dam, which was about 100 years old when it was torn down. That dam, when it first went in, failed catastrophically the first winter. Um, and so after that happened, uh, a few people died on that. It was a tragic event. They basically made this dam here. This is the dam part. This is the old canyon here. This is just the spill gates and then the powerhouse. The, this dam was created by a whole bunch of people with mules and dirt and rocks just dumping crud into a canyon and trying to fill it up to make this dam work again. And so when they took this thing out, there was a lot of uh, uh, speculation about what they'd find and, how, and, and uh, a lot of debate on how they should take it out. That's a whole other story um, that I won't get into, but um, these, these do have some, some interesting history to them. Um, if, you, if you are interested in this type of uh, thing, I will say this. Uh, there is a, a wonderful book and a wonderful movie on the Elwha now. Um, I can uh, point you in the right direction. I think, no, I don't have that slide in um, at the end but I can point you towards those. Um, if you just Google Elwha, the word up there, E-L-W-H-A, you'll, you'll see it. It was also featured in um, Damnation, that movie. You might have seen that film came out last year or so. Anyway, um, what I'm going to show you is certainly not 
my own. Um, these are a bunch of colleagues that contributed to this talk from a number of agencies and universities and institutions, et cetera. Um, I would read this list, but it would add much more time. Uh, some fantastic folks working on this. It's really been a pleasure to work with them. And funding sources from all over the place, from the interior where I work, uh, to uh, NSF, EPA, et cetera. A whole bunch of fantastic groups rallying around this. So, so really, this, uh, this whole story gets to some of the, the issues we face here in our country with uh, a number of things, one of which is um, aging infrastructure. Uh, a couple few years back, we had dam or, uh, bridges failing in the Midwest, and, and now we're starting to think about what do we do with all these old dams? Do we need all of them? Do we maybe need some new ones in some places or not? There's a lot of debates about this, but I, I like this plot. It's a little bit dated now. My friend Martin Doyle put it together uh, over a decade ago, but this shows the dam construction in the U.S sort of peaking in the 50s and 60s. And so we have an, uh, a lot of infrastructure out there. You can see this is dams per decade. So we have you know, tens of thousands of dams out there. Um, and a lot of them are sort of reaching their end of life. Um, and what do you do with a structure like that? When it, uh, um, it's a very difficult question. There are uh, something like 75,000 substantial dams, and William Graff, in his paper, he decide, uh, described a substantial dam as being one that could capture a full year worth of runoff in its reservoir. So, uh, so 75,000, that would be about one. You'd build one per day since the signing of the Constitution or so. So um, we didn't do that. Of course, we did it all in the 50s and 60s. But there's a lot of concrete out there in our channels. Um, 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 and we are, as a nation, we are, are deciding um, sort of together that some of these don't make any sense anymore. We, we, should, we, should, we should just get rid of them. And there's been a number of larger dam removals, uh, especially in the Pacific Northwest and, and on the, in the Midwest and on the East Coast. Um, some of the biggest ones now are, bit, are in the Pacific Northwest, though. Uh, and the largest of which in the world is the one I'll be talking about here at the Elwong Lions Canyon up in, up in Washington. And of course, we have some... Uh, some almost completed work, I guess, on San Clemente Dam here. Um, if anyone studying that in the room? No? No? OK, I know there's some folks down at uh, CSU Monterey Bay who are, are actively working on that. And of course, we have these, these sort of the problem children down here, Matilha and Ringe, which we could talk about if you're interested in. But what do you do with those? Um, uh, they're full of sediment and serve no purpose, really, at all. Um, there's another reason that this is somewhat interesting to us uh, at the USGS and to some of our colleagues and collaborators. And that is sort of all these sort of stresses that the ocean will be feeling in the future. One of which, and of course, this is a recent paper that talked about that. But, but most notably for us, uh, one of the important things that we're thinking a lot about is sea level and what, do we, what happens to our coastlines uh, when, we, when we see um, large increases in sea level. And so one of the things um, that people are talking about is, well, can our coastal wetlands survive these things, and what, and, and what is the outlook for them? And I know there's probably some folks here in this room thinking about this and working on this. But uh, you know, one of the ideas is that, if, is that sediment can play an important role in uh, building these landforms over time. And what role does that play? And, and how do you even, if you want to try to add sediment to these things, how do you do that? That's lots of difficult questions there. But it's this, so what I'm, what I'm showing today is an example of sort of allowing sediment to go into a coastal zone, what happens to that coastal system when, when we see new sediment. One of the really interesting things with the Elwha project is that uh, it's run by the National Park. It's, it's, the watershed lies almost wholly within the National Park. So this is Olympic National Park just uh, west of Seattle in the Olympic Mountains. Um, I like to say in my talks, this is a fantastic place. If you've never been there, you, you should spend some time up there. And Kathleen, your son, should have gone. He would, oh, he did. I thought you said he didn't go. Oh, you both? OK, move on. <laughs> I thought you said he didn't go, because Nature Bridge is right there. It's such a neat place. But, um, but the neat thing is that you know, these dams didn't allow salmon to uh, return to these spawning grounds throughout the National Park. And by removing them, providing that access, um, fish could then return to these, uh, these basically undisturbed um, landscapes. 
So um, this all came about um, through many, many decades of, of, of uh, discussions and conflicts and lawsuits and, and you name it, it's all in the history books. And if you're interested, I, I could point you toward, I guess, two that would, would document that really well. Um, and and we, a very important event occurred uh, in 92. Uh, it was passed by Congress and signed by Bush one, and that was the Elwell Restoration Act. And this law basically was designed for this river, and this law said this. We, uh, it dictated the full restoration of the Elwell River ecosystem and basically forced the removal of these two large structures so that the native Salmonids could uh, return and, and spawn in these rivers. Um, didn't provide funding, right? This is a $350 million project, right? There's no funding. Um, but uh, it, it dictated that it needed to happen. It took 20 years to find the funding. Uh, almost 20 years. Um, um, and again, finally, the, the dams were, were taken out. Uh, those are all stories we could talk about. Uh, but here, here are those historic spawning runs for just two of uh, the salmonid species. This is, and I've placed the dams there. So this is a map view of their spring and summer fall runs uh, for the Chinook, the Kings, uh, and the dams, the lower dam was there and the upper dam was here. So you can see much of this habitat was inaccessible from these species. Coho had very little spawning grounds left. Um, and there was substantial degradation of that lower channel. I'll show you that too. You know, when you put in a dam, you're not just cutting off things from getting upstream, but you're also cutting off important uh, sediments and nutrients and things from getting downstream. And that certainly uh, influenced this lower watershed. And I'll show you that in a little bit. Um, one of the, the real difficulties beyond funding was was this, is that there was you know, 21 million cubic meters. It's not, that's a number I can't get my head around. Um, it's a lot of sediment, right? There's a lot of sediment in these reservoirs. And what do you do? Do you just let it go down a national park in, to the ocean? Uh, or, do you, or should we bring trucks in? We'll bring trucks in. Well, if we brought in trucks, it would take uh, over a million trucks. It's enough trucks to line uh, from here to the East Coast and back end to end. Right, and run them up a little road in a national park for the next 10 years? Is that, should, is that a good option? Um, so there, a lot of thought and investigation went into this, or you could try to leave it in place. Um, and what uh, was determined uh, was basically, uh, my uh, colleague of mine uh, who works for the Elwha tribe says it's sort of like having surgery. You know, you're, we have this system that is diseased or injured or something, right, because of the dams. We need to go through the surgery. And when you go through surgery, you, you kind of hurt yourself again, right? You cut, or you, right, fuse, whatever happens. And you have this injury, then you have to bounce back. And so basically, the surgery approach was taken in that these dams were removed, and the sediment was allowed to, in a sense, naturally flow out of the system um, uh, because it was deemed a valuable resource for the system. Um, so yeah, I drew some pictures. These are, these are Olympic tracks. Um, so they're basically over twice a football field. Um, so that's the Empire State Building. So these are the two reservoirs. Um, if you st stood all that sediment on top of it, I don't know, you know, that help? It's, you know, a couple Empire State Buildings worth of sediment on top of a track or something. You can play games like that all you want. But um, so we, uh, I was not involved in the removal or in, in that type of planning. My work as a scientist was to work with a group and address these questions. Um, and we thought it was very important to, to do this well because this management uh, option, r full removal of dams, is becoming a viable one for many aging dams. And so we wanted it to figure out what's going to happen to the fish, what will happen to the ecosystems, and what's going to happen to the, the sediment. And here's a very simple conceptual model, um, you know, very simple to probably understand graphic where you have these, with time, you have these different stages of, you know, here's where sediment starved in general because it's all being captured by the reservoir. We have this massive influx and then some sort of reworking and restoration over years. Um, and then salmon may come back, um, kind of a thing. But um, this group got together and with sort of very little funding tried to do the best science we could to understand these things. 
So a little more history. There was a lot of hoopla on events in um, 2011 uh, that you'll see governors and senators and all kinds of secretaries and stuff in photos like this. And it was a very uh, interesting and important event to um, one of the, 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 the really critical um, um, elements to this whole project is that th there is a, a tribe that lives on this river and uh, has lived there for thousands of years and they were very much part of not only this event but of the whole restoration it's been it's and they are true partners in much of the work that we do and it's been uh, it's been probably one of the most beneficial things I've ever done uh, to sort of work with my colleagues there and, and get their understanding of the river and how important the restoration is to them Etc. Um, anyway, so let's watch. This is that day of the event. We that that big party you just saw was held over here, um, and these are people walking off of the dam. And so, um, and this was a, a uh, 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 some construction equipment um, that was starting to work. What what is happening right now is they built this this coffer dam. A uh, coffer dam is basically dirt, right? You pile up. And this is what you do. The kids do on the beach, right? When you're trying to make dams and stuff, right? We build a little dam here and we're routing all the water there and you start working on the dam here to take it out. So here you, you see there's a notch taken out here. This is from a cam. You can go online and watch this cam until your, your eyes hurt. Um, and then, which I have done many times, so then you can, uh, you know, they're taking it out, taking it out, and eventually you get to the point where like, okay, that's, that's, that's in a good state. We're ready for water to flow down that section, so then we can work on the other side. And so this dam was taken out by basically flopping back and forth between two channels. So again, the left-hand side as you're looking at it is the former canyon. The right-hand side is just the spill gates. Here's that initial trickle of water coming down. You can see the, the dark sediment. And then there it goes. And then finally, there's a little bit higher flow. And eventually, they're working on a new coffer dam to close off this channel. And then... Uh, they get that done, and then they start ripping that out. They did that about a dozen times to bring this thing down. Uh, this is roughly a 34 meter, 100 foot dam. Um, and it took about um, five months to get it to that. And then they filled in this hill and have uh, revegetated it and, and the such. Um, so fairly fast. Um, uh, Glines Canyon Dam, the upper dam, is 64 meters or so in total height, you know, 200 feet. And uh, it was a different story. This is a concrete arch dam. The former dam was the one that failed catastrophically, and they filled a bunch of dirt in. They weren't sure what they were going to find. This was a, is a concrete arch dam, so classic sort of dam, where it's sort of arched in a canyon, right, and anchored on each side. Um, fairly thin structure. So one day in September of 2011, this thing, you know, something and the can, this thing showed up and some dust was coming up and it was this. You basically put a barge out and put a hydraulic hammer uh, and you, you, you pay a person extra money, uh, hazard pay, to s break down the structure that is holding them up above a 150 foot canyon. And they just chipped away at this thing uh, sort of with time. Uh, they took some breaks when the uh, salmon were spawning to try to limit the turbidity effects downstream. Um, and they brought it down roughly halfway. And at that point, the, the sediment behind the dam, and I'll show you this in a second, had prograded to the actual dam. And so this was truly just a waterfall. There was no more reservoir behind it after. This is getting very close. The, the, the delta is prograding toward this. And then they came through, and of course, what do you do then? You use explosives, right? And so. You blow the thing up. And so this is what it looked like uh, uh, about two years later. Um, there's just a little fragment uh, left there. And they, they actually still were working a little bit on this this weekend. But, but now you can go up there. They left this section up on the right hand, these old spill gates. And you, there's wonderful interpretive maps and drawings and stuff. If you up there, do, do this stop. And you can walk out and sit right there and look over into this 200 foot plus canyon. It's, it's fantastic. It's a, it's a really interesting place to be. Um, so I was part of, of what we sort of considered the sediment team and our big focus was to sort of try to think about the system, break the system up into different sections, the reservoirs, the, the sediment transport down through the river, the actual movement of material, how the river and side channels would change in their uh, morphology. Um, 
uh, the estuary, which Melissa talked a bunch about, uh, I think last year, and then sort of the coast, the shoreline. And, and we really wanted to quantify these, you know, how much sediment was going where uh, and, and, and why, in a sense. Um, so if you're really interested in this, we have a, a five new papers, a, a set of new papers in geomorphology that came out earlier this year, and then Melissa just published a paper in limnology and oceanography. So you can certainly dig into the details uh, all you want to, uh, if you like, or if you'd like to see some data, my data is your data, I work for you. Um, being a federal government employee, so uh, I'd be pleased to share my data with you um, if you want to see it. So I'm just going to go through those sections uh, sort of quickly, go work your way downstream and look at each section and talk, you know, give a couple highlights that, from each of those papers. So here's some photographs of, of the reservoir sort of midway through dam removal. I talked about this delta, this is the upper dam, or the upper reservoir, that this, this delta prograded towards the, the uh, the dam site there is just off, off the photo. And you can see that delta front there as this sort of is being eroded and moved. The original sort of delta extended to about there in the reservoir. And you know, there it is. You can see how much the, river, the reservoir had been drained. And there's Lake Aldwell, which is the, the, the downstream reservoir or former reservoir. These are all, by the way, all these little black dots, those are all old cedar stumps that were logged before. These are old growth cedar stumps. They're massive all over the floodplain. Um, they were logged right before they, they built the dam. Um, so uh, we were talking to a group of us earlier today about structure for motion and some of the neat new technologies coming online with uh, photo, you know, sort of new age photogrammetry. And uh, I was telling the folks that you know, we, we had maybe enough in our budget to do uh, one LIDAR scan of this, of this system. We thought, oh, okay, you know, we need to time that just perfectly because we want to get a good picture of what, this, what these features look like. And, and, and you don't need to be a fluvial geomorphologist to see that those things are dynamic, right? You can see that those things are changing all the time. So we thought, how can we time this LIDAR collection to, just, to get you know, something representative or learn something? And then my good friend Andy Ritchie said, there's this new photogrammetry stuff that's coming online. Let's just throw a, a little point and shoot camera in this wing of this, of this airplane. We'll spend $350 a flight for them to fly over the river valley um, uh, four times, uh, and we can contact that through DOI, Department of Interior, and, and do hundreds of surveys for the price of a LIDAR survey. And I said, you're crazy, and then he, he showed me how you use this software and build these, this is a sort of the building of a 3D model, and you come up with results like this for $350 for a flight. Um, and this is, was taken right after that LIDAR we took, and we, our RMS error is something like 25 centimeters. That's darn good enough for me, um, especially if I can get multiple images. So this is a really neat technology. If anyone's interested in building 3D models of anything, there's a whole new world out there. Um, and, uh, and you'll see your colleagues doing this if, if, if you get into sort of spatial monitoring or spatial mapping, things like that. Um, archaeologists are very much all over this technology. It's a really neat technology. Anyway, because we did that, we, did, we could fly like every other week. And we did. Uh, and here's just some of the, this is just you know, annual results. So these are the kinds of results that you could get. So this is just erosion and deposition during the first year and the second year of the project. Um, and you can see like during the first year, there's a lot of erosion from the original delta. The upstream, the dam site is up here, north is up. And a lot of deposition, this is all from this was all underwater before. This was, that, that was mapped with echo sounders. So this, and then you can see that once it was all uh, sediment, then you can see the erosion in sizing. Of course, these are just maps over a year, but we had every, basically every other week we had maps like this. And you can do neat things like this. You can watch the, the evolution of that sediment lobe. This is just the thalweg, so this is just the, the lowest point in the channel, tracking that with time um, in a profile. So this is uh, the dam. Uh, each of these figures is basically at the right-hand side of that image. So you can see the, the reservoir water here, right? And there's that lobe of sediment. And as you go, you can see the erosion and deposition of material into the reservoir. And eventually, the reservoir is gone. And then you see the cutting down of that, that stuff. So, and these are just, you know, again, a, a few of the, the images were used to create this kind of stuff. Um, that's all in one of the papers. You can check that out if you're interested. 
Another thing we, were, we did was a lot of measurements uh, and monitoring of what was moving down the, the channel. We had three main stations to do this. Physical sampling was a very important, uh, uh, using sort of standard methodologies. But we also used optics and uh, uh, acoustics of different sorts, uh, all kinds of things to, um, that the EPA helped us fund and do. Um, here are some of those sites. So we had a site upstream of the, the sort of get background conditions. We had a site uh, between the dams and then one downstream of the dams um, to look at changes uh, um, as you move down the system. Um, and you know, you see things like this. This is like that first dam breach that I showed you a picture of earlier. And this is just the optical turbidity sensor. Uh, you know, during that breach, here's that breach, and you can see a higher background level. These are days. Or no, sorry, these are weeks. Um, we published a little thing in EOS on sort of these early effects of the dam removal. Uh, you can check that out if you're interested. Um, and and you can you know using all those techniques, you can build data like this. And I, I apologize, I do not have a uh, uh, a scale on here. This is two years of data. So this is two years of of water flow in the river and two years of uh, sediment concentration, so basically the, how much sediment was, was it suspended up in the water column. And this is a log plot, so you can see here, this is the sort of summer low flow and then the winter high flows, and then this is the spring sort of snow melt and then the summer low flow again. And you can see like during uh, this year, this is 2013, there were, you know, 1,000 to 10,000 grams per liter almost for, for months, months, months. That's a lot of sediment thing was just like a mud bath, okay? We thought it would be, and it was. Um, um, this had big effects on a number of things, and I don't have time to talk about them, but, um, um, uh, and, and uh, lots of, uh, uh, of uh, activities were done to basically prevent some of the negative effects of this. We knew this was coming. And so, for example, the, uh, the, the Chinook that were returning to the river were either transported up and around the streets of the river and brought to the upper uh, portions of the river, or they were uh, placed into, um, um, into pens and basically uh, became uh, hatchery fish. So there was, an, and some were allowed, of course, to go through it, uh, which is interesting because I'll, I'll show you in a, in a little bit. This year, you would think nothing could survive through this stuff, but we, uh, my colleagues found Chinook spawning in tributaries off the main stem. Of course, they found that clear water and then spawned there. Um, pretty interesting stories. I'll show you that data at the very end. Um, I don't know, you can look at different things, but uh, that's just a bunch of data. Um, so then we also, if you're interested in that, you can look at that paper. There's a second paper on that, okay? So I'm walking through these papers and these sort of sections of the river. So what happened to the channel morphology? And so this is a, this is a test, and I'll tell you, third graders get this right, so you better, <laughs> right? So all the professors are looking very carefully around, right? The students, this is for you. So what's different? Which, which picture is different and why? One picture is different. One of these things is not like the other, <laughs> right? Which one is it? Come on, you can do it. You Come on, hand. Yeah, you. I saw the, uh, what's that? So I was the top, left. top left, right? OK. Are you smarter than a fifth grader? OK. You are. Uh, I'm sorry. I don't, I don't mean I, I don't mean that crudely. Or, I don't mean it. Yeah, I, no, I, I say this because I have a sixth grader, and, and often I feel this is so stupid. Um, it, it's, uh, yeah, I mean, these kids are smart, right? They're really, really smart. It's a neat thing. So yeah, uh, uh, so yes, that one's different. Why, why is it different? Yeah, the sediment. Okay, these are photos before dam removal. These are photos of the channel of the Elwell River before dam removal. One is in a different place. One, the one on the upper left, is taken up above both of the dams. Okay, the other two were taken either between the dams or below both dams. Okay, and you can see we we call this an armored condition. Uh, you know, if you're a geomorphologist, armored just meaning it, the big stuff's all left, right? The, these, the, the, this was all this. This is like ankle twisting, you know, landform. This is not stuff you want to go. I mean, you, we would go sample this all the time, but this is not stuff that salmon particularly want to spawn in. They can't. Um, and so this is one of those effects. And this is a well-known effect. It's been talked about a lot in the geomorphic literature. Is that sort of in a sense starving of sediment downstream of 
reservoirs of, of dams, right? And here's a perfect example, my colleague Amy East, who has published on this for this river. And so before the dam removal, we were already in the state where the channel downstream was not good habitat for uh, the Salmonids uh, um, because of the, uh, the, the lack of gravel. Um, so what happened when the dam removal occurred? Well, um, the, the, a lot of that material was, was, in a sense, resupplied to this channel, and the channel responded in, in very interesting ways. Here's a, a sort of before-after survey of sort of that big pulse of sediment that came through in 2013, the biggest pulse we've seen. Um, and you can see how much aggradation occurred and how much raising of that level. On average, about a meter of aggradation occurred throughout the channel, all the way down. The, the, uh, from the, the reservoirs to the coast. And here's some pictures of that at, at sort of the last meander bend. This is the last point bar of the river. Um, and you can see sort of this, this fining and also look how much woody debris came in. Tremendous amounts of woody debris. The woody debris story of this is a whole nother talk and someone should give it, in, it to you. And you, it's wonderful. The, the amount of wood that was basically starved of this system and, and the importance of wood in these streams is, 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 can't be overemphasized because it adds that habitat complexity in channels. It's a place where various species can hide and find refuge and things like that. And um, the, the, the wood resupply to the system was really a, a neat, neat story. Um, there are ways to monitor this, and I won't tell you all the details of this, but basically these are stage measurements. So stage is just the height of the water surface. And, and uh, what you can do is normalize that height. You know, it's going to go up as a, you, know, you get rain up in the watershed. You might, you know, flows come up and, and go down, et cetera. But if you take that and sort of normalize it to what it should have been for the flow when it started, there's a way to do this, and I could tell you about it. Um, you get sort of a relative water stage um, to a reference condition. Um, so what you see here are not the, the wiggles. Uh, uh, especially these big wiggles are associated with changes in the channel that are pushing water up higher than it would have been for the same flow. That makes sense. So for the same flow over here on the right hand side, uh, you know, it is, the water surface is a, about a meter higher than it would have been, you know, back here. And so this is that, what we think of in geomorphology as this wave of sediment pushing through this system. And um, and so these, these sampling stations are downstream of the upper dam. This purple one, you can see there's incision. That was actually in the delta of the, the second reservoir. So it's actually incising, you see that. Um, and then these are the lower river. You can see that they, you know, a little bit later, these are coming up. There's obviously some wiggles and stuff that are related to all kinds of things that are influencing the water surface, including that woody debris, et cetera. But it's fairly interesting to see this wave of sediment come through and then it getting incised and then here it's reaching the lower river. And, and if you're interested in that kind of stuff, um, uh, Amy wrote this paper. It's a, it's a really neat paper. And, and uh, I could tell you more about the results, but I need to get on so we can get to the coast. Um, so here's uh, some photographs of what it looked sort of before and after that flood, that sediment wave came through sort of the middle reach. Um, one of the things that happened is these pools, a lot of the pools in the channel, or all the pools basically filled. And we saw um, um, this, this widening of the channel and sort of more meandering. And so here you can see the channel. If you follow sort of the, what's called the Thalwig, the deepest part of the channel, you can see here it's somewhat longer here. And that is a, a, a measure that we call sinuosity. So if you take sort of the straight line distance and then the Thalweg distance down the channel, you call that the sinuosity. It's just a ratio of those two distances. And we saw that increase with time, uh, which is consistent with a, a lot of the other observations. So it's, it, it's somewhat minor, but it, it increased. Um, this braiding index is, a, is an index of the number of stream channels on average per reach of, of stream. One of the interesting things here to note is that um, the braiding index is sort of near two and maybe increased. It's, kind of, it's sort of jumping around a bit. Um, so so just to, to think about this, this channel on average has you know, two threads throughout its whole reach. And, and this is a, um, you know, a lot of people think of river channels being single threaded. You know? This definitely is not one of those rivers. Uh, it's a very complex and um, multi-threaded uh, uh, channel. Um, 
I showed you photos of this, but here's some data uh, from a whole host, hundreds of samples, showing that a fining in the sediment grain size of the, of the channel material. So this is grain size and feed. This is a log base two, you know, geologists. Can you, can you just forgive us, please? I'm sorry we do this to you. Ivana, why do we do this? It's just ridiculous. This having, like, this doubling ratio or having thing. Okay, that's what we do. I apologize. Um, it's set in stone, literally. Uh, and so we, um, uh, so these are, these are names you might understand better, right? Uh, sand and pebbles and things like that. But you can see, you know, in the middle reach and lower reach, definitely this, this finding trend. Um, but g mostly getting down to sort of this, this, uh, gravel region. Okay, let's get to the coast. This is the stuff that I've uh, worked mostly on. Um, and it's, it's uh, I think, really uh, some interesting stuff. So here's some photos of sort of before and during the early stages of dam removal when we started to see some of the fine sediment wa wash out. And then uh, later on after that sediment wave passed through some of the building of bars and stuff at the river mouth. Um, this is roughly uh, 150 meters or 200 meters of of, of sort of growth there. I mean, if you go to the surf line out here, um, pretty substantial um, thing. So, so just quickly, uh, a little bit about the setting. Um, it's a very interesting setting in that it's, it's, we're now in the Strait of Juan de Fuca. So we're not open coastal like here where we're getting bombarded by large waves today, right? This is sort of tucked in this little uh, waterway that connects the, the Salish Sea, the Puget Sound and Georgia Basin, with the Pacific Ocean. And there's two sort of interesting things that occur then. One is that the waves are primarily just coming down the strait. There's, there are some local waves that are generated by local winds, but in generally, the, the, the waves that get to this feature here come down that channel. They have to, right? They're, that's the only place they, they really can. But, you know, swell can come from is down here. And we have uh, uh, wave records that we've collected and we, we see that. Right? Um, and one of the interesting geomorphic features that occur, of course, is these, this thing right here, is that this, this natural hook, right? We see those, those types of features build where we have really strong, obliquely directed waves. Um, because all that sediment is being washed down the littoral cell and building out that long spit with time. And there's a, you know, Dungeness spit is another one further to the east. It's sort of a, a very characteristic. In fact, if there are these paleo spits for the, all you geo geeks out there. There's actually um, paleo spits under, that are buried uh, underwater that um, as sea level came up were sort of abandoned. So you can see them offshore. It's really interesting stuff. Um, that's number one. Number two is that the, uh, you know, the tides, all the water basically that comes in here comes from the ocean. And of course, the tides are about two meters and plus as you go further up into the, into the Salish Sea. And so there's a lot of water sloshing in and out and in and out of this place. And so if you were to sit out here uh, at one of our sites and measure currents, you would commonly measure tidal currents with amplitudes of about a meter per second, day in and day out. So um, those are pretty ripping. Um, I don't know if you've ever tried to swim that fast, but um, try it. Um, <laughs> Let me know how you do. Um, the other thing is that, you know, in the river we saw a very, um, uh, you know, this armored condition downstream of the dams. At the river mouth, we saw persistent erosion of the shoreline. Um, um, here are just some, uh, some examples and photographs of features that you, you know, this was a monument that was placed in the late 1800s. It went on, originally on the map, it was over a quarter of a mile from the ocean. It fell into the ocean in 2012. Just as that delta was rebuilding, it finally met its match in the ocean. It's been replaced back inland and reset and calibrated. There's actually a whole organization, or national, there's a federal group that does this. It resets these monuments and resurveys them. It's interesting. Anyway, whatever. So uh, here's a, um, and here, you know, what's that? That's, that's something you, you trip and fall over, right? That's a scarp, right? That's an erosional feature on a beach. So also, you know, you look at the grain size, it's fairly uh, coarse stuff. And this is just some sur uh, summaries of some aerial photos that we uh, had that showed in this erosion over time of that shoreline. Um, roughly two meters a year over the last two decades is what we measured. Um, so fairly fast rates of erosion. I mean, if you lost two meters of your backyard every year, that would, uh, you know, in fact, this fellow who lived right here did, and he told me some stories about it. This is a tribal member who was a, a very nice man, but 
lost a lot of what his grandpa owned um, way back when. So the photographs that Andy took to look at the reservoir changes, we actually uh, we, we had them taken all the way to the coastline, and thank goodness we did, because wow, look, you, 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 start, you can start seeing the changes that occurred down there. And here we're documenting, I'm just showing some of the photos, I'm not showing all of them, some of the building of this, uh, this feature, and there's a lot of neat morphology. Again, if you're a geo geek like I am, that you kind of start salivating when you see things like this. Um, you see new bars growing out there where those waves are breaking. And, uh, and, and how these bars are, are actually pushed back towards shore. Here's, you know, these are, these are photo mosaics, so where you see waves. Sometimes you see single waves, but often they're sort of smoothed over because there's multiple looks. Look how big this feature is getting. Um, sorry about the feet units there. And, it, you know, sort of shrinking it. And as new sediments uh, are pushed down shore, and then here after a big event, there's actually a new bar that's just formed out there. So fantastic record. Um, you can see the woody debris that's being, these are huge logs that are now um, brought down the river and now along the whole shoreline. Um, fantastic um, record there in those photos. I just showed you, a, excuse me, a couple of them. Here's, um, here's the type of stuff we do twice a year. This is, this is the same stuff we just did here in northern Monterey Bay, Ivana. We were talking about this before the talk. That we, we take our jet skis and do bathymetry offshore. So we have an echo sanders and GPS. We drive those around. Uh, and then we have people like me with uh, GPS on their backs. And we, you know, we walk 10 miles a day or something to, to where these red lines are up and down the coast. We take sediment samples and stuff. And, and we can build maps such as this to, to really quantify those changes, not just from a pretty picture, but in sort of both above the ground and, and below the water line, the sort of growth and geomorphic features of this, uh, these type, this, this uh, new sediment. And you can do things like this. You can difference those maps and, and look at the total deposition. So this is an area, it says over five meters, but I'll tell you there's, there's 10 meters of deposition in some places. Um, 10 meters, that's what, five of me on top of each other. Um, so um, that's a lot. Um, interesting patterns. Uh, there's a secondary pattern, which is, is caused by the tides. And there's no time to talk about it. But here's, um, here's, uh, here are some cross sections. So this is B, C, D, and E. Here's B, C, D, and E. I, I told you there's 10 meters. And here, here you go. This is that building out of that, that new material uh, into this new delta landform. We've been looking at grain sizes and how this is influencing the the, the ecosystems offshore. One of the interesting things is that we've seen, this is some backscatter from sonar, black colors are, are finer sediments, sands and muds, and the, the grays and whites are sort of our gravel and rock. Uh, it's interesting that we don't see much change out here. Our understanding is that those tidal currents I talked about are so fast that, that sand and, and mud just uh, are unable to deposit. If they are deposited, during uh, slower currents, the next tide comes through and just rips them away. So we're only seeing sort of the fine deposition right sort of around the coast. And then in this, this area, what we call Freshwater Bay, where the, uh, the currents are, are reduced because of the sort of this topographic feature here. And I can show you that in, in, if you're interested. Um, this is sort of the, the mass balance of sediment coming in to that coastal zone. You can see here is that big wave of sediment reaching, and then we, you know, rates have slowed down. But so far, we've seen about three, almost four million now of our last survey in July of total sediment deposited in offshore here. Um, this was one of the goals is to put together a sediment budget. And so everything I just talked about and all the nitty gritty details of that went into this figure. and. Um, and there's just a couple things I'd like to point out. This is just two years. We're working on the four-year sediment budget currently. And I, you know, in six months, I'll have a new graphic to show you. But this is sort of for the first two years where, again, most of the, the sediment came through the system, or a lot of it did. Um, a couple things. This upstream supply was very minimal compared to what was coming out of these reservoirs. The Lake Mills, the upper reservoir, where there was more sediment, really sort of uh, dominated the budget. Um, you know, we, I, I showed you that there was a lot of sedimentation in those channels, you know, a meter or so on average across that channel. But really, that's sort of a drop in the bucket compared to what came out to the coast. Um, and um, um, I know Melissa talked about the same sort of rates of deposition in the estuary, but really, it's, it's really just a drop compared to what came out on the coast. Most of the deposition in the nearshore is sand and gravel and, 
and and the mud basically was dispersed far field and and we uh, uh, found very little of the, the mud balance and I, I don't think yeah I think I have it here this is sort of you know, if you think about that that mass balance in sort of grain sizes separated by the you know silt and clay here is fine grained and sand and gravel is coarse grained one of the interesting things to, to see here is that more coarse grain sediment was eroded and transported out of the system than fine grained and that may seem weird um, but it, it's consistent with what the way the dam because this, the upper dam was removed slowly the the, um, the coarse sediments that were in the delta were sort of eroded and placed on top of all the muds that were in the lake bottom and basically buried them and sort of armored them for a while. And so we had a lot more sand and gravel transport once the dam, uh, you know, that delta had prograded all the way to the dam. We had a lot more sand and gravel being discharged from that, that upper reservoir. Um, so it was sort of coarse grain dominated. Okay, so we've had full removal. We, this summer, you may have read about there's even there, there, some of the, there are some large boulders that fell off this, this wall during dam construction 100 years ago almost, and uh, those were blown up this summer to help fish passage. Um, so we continue to monitor this stuff. There's a, uh, there's a lot to focus on this right now, is what, where is the system going ecologically? Uh, and so a lot of my colleagues are, are focusing on this. this. These are some interesting recent results um, from Mike McHenry and, and crew um, showing the Chinook Red. So sh sh Red, anyone know what a Red is? Anyone know what a Red is? Yeah? What's a Red? Spawning grounds, right? So this is, these are sort of the, the Chinook, the kings, they build these mounds and put their eggs in them. And so these are maps of where those occurred. That first year where the sediment concentrations were so high, we the, the divers could, could not sample this area. This is where that former dam was, so anything here would be new, and we found them up here in these tributaries, and then right at the base, near the base of the former dam. And then with time, you just see this expansion up to the dam. Not many seeming to get through the dam, maybe a couple, and that's one of the reasons that they blew up those rocks. Um, here are some numbers of the total number of Chinook spawn, or, or reds. So we've seen this increase with reds with time. That's, that's a good sign. Um, uh, the estuary has changed a bunch. And this is sort of some stuff that, um, that Melissa said But at, uh, last time she was here. But at a point in the estuary, uh, you could think about being in one place in the estuary and with that expansion of that delta, that the conditions at that, that location. So what used to be an estuary is now basically off-river habitat. Right, it's freshwater habitat. So this is a long time series of just salinity and then looking with time, sort of these salinity habitats based on uh, these uh, salinity classes. So at this point that you, you know, we used to have this, this estuary, but now we have freshwater habitat. And now that estuary in reach is basically 200 meters further offshore than what used to be ocean. So it's interesting to think about that. Um, we have also done quite a bit of work on the, the um, the habitats, near shore habitats offshore of the river mouth. We've done lots of dive surveys. Uh, we have a whole dive survey program in the summertime that's mimicked off of Pisco. And we, uh, colleagues are doing uh, video tows, looking and, and classifying everything that they can in, in video tows. And so here's some maps of, of where that's done around the delta and then sort of in some control sites uh, further away from the delta. And this is just to show this total, this is from the video data, just a, a quick snapshot of that kind of data, showing that we've had these, this is pre-removal vegetation below 15 meters, so sort of near shore, fairly deeper near shore waters. And this here around the river mouth, we've seen these big decreases in vegetation, especially in kelp. Uh, um, uh, and that uh, perhaps was expected, um, um, but certainly, uh, uh, a big effect of this dam removal has been the um, reduction in kelp around the river mouth. Um, and then just one lesson learned before I get you guys out of here. Um, I, I would, if, you, if you're interested in this, I would point you towards Jim's uh, recent article on science. He, um, he points out that we've now had a lot of dam removals. Um, and of course, the Elwha here, uh, the biggest one so far. And, one of the things that sort of is surprising to, to a lot of the folks in the community is sort of how fast these systems 
are passing sediment through um, their reservoirs and, and their river reaches, and more so than we had modeled or thought. Um, and so a lot of the folks in the field are sort of having to rethink our models and how we use them to try to understand these, these things. And so this is an area that we're still learning a lot and trying to, to take results to, like I showed you today and basically better predict what might happen in, for the next, uh, next one. So thank you very much. Um, I hope there's beer later, no? But if not, I will forgive you, and uh, I thank you for inviting me. I, I think as a geologist, I have to say beer once in my talk, right? Or wine. Or wine. <laughs> wine, yes, right, wine. So can I start with a question? Please do. Was, this is really fantastic. Thank you so much. It's uh, spectacular. I was wondering if, uh, What's the forecast for the next uh, say 10 years? I mean, you're now changing the head of the river. You're moving offshore, so you're changing the equilibrium profile of the river. Absolutely. So you're expecting more erosion uh, in the back? I mean, yeah. because eventually it's going to pass back. Yeah, I know. And we're already seeing that. Um, this summer, we're, we were seeing pools form again in the river. Um, we haven't seen a contraction of the delta yet. And so that lower river, form hasn't uh, seen changes like that. But up, uh, just downstream of both dams, some of those pools are now being scoured out again. So we're seeing, again, it sort of gets that Jim's thought. Of these, things, these systems are really responding quickly. Um, we, before this removal, there was a bunch of modeling done by a, a group of colleagues of mine and sort of predicting that we would see that sediment for decades in this channel. And now we're starting to think, a decade, maybe, you know? Um, certainly there are going to be deposits on floodplains and, and a whole uh, uh, new morphology because of that. Um, but yeah, it, it's... it's uh, what about the long term changes in the equilibrium profile? Because the river yeah. has accommodated, now it's stretched. Yeah. Now it's actually longer. So is it going to start uh, eroding the happening? Mountains. I mean, are you going to start seeing more erosion? Or? Uh, I don't think so. I mean, a lot of the erosion in the mountains is is, uh, is sort of, there's a lot of bedrock reaches in the channel on the mountains, so they're, they're not set by that. So if in, in a more literal channel, we might see something like that, where you have a propagation of an erosional wave up into that channel, right? In okay. here, we have enough bedrock constrictions that we, we shouldn't see that. Gotcha. Um, uh, yeah, but certainly we are seeing that on the local reach effect, where you have supplies of sediment reduced because the, this pulse has gone through, and now the capacity of the river overwhelms that and so it it's really these out. So on the local effect, yes, but not. I wouldn't. We shouldn't see that propagate up because there's a couple, uh, uh, yeah, bedrock constrictions there. Mm -hmm. yeah, that's a good question. Yeah, that's good. Yeah. So this, this might border a little bit too much on the ecology, but I get the evolution of it and trying to get the system back, or seeing how it goes back to more uh, of an unmanipulated system. Is there anything that emerged during the formation of the dam, the years of the dam, where there was 100 years, mm -hmm. that became accustomed to that is now gone? Besides the dam. Oh. <laughs> I mean, were there, I'm thinking like activities of, of animals or other features that showed up that are totally critical that are now left that are now missed. <laughs> yeah, I mean, it, it, from a real basic one, right? The, the reservoirs, right? You have a, a lake, lacustrians, or a habitat. And there, were, uh, there are certain bird species that utilize that. And certainly there's a loss uh, of those habitats. And there, was, there, was a, a, there were some people who were very concerned about that, um, certainly. Um, Another one, the kelp beds, you know? This kelp habitat, which of course locally we think so highly of, right? And the kelp is like, it, right? Um, <laughs> well, well, maybe not, okay. <laughs> <laughs> Whatever, but, uh, we're, seeing, we're seeing this, you know, a couple kilometers of coast used to have near, uh, near Assistus all over the place, and all this understory kelp is not there anymore. It'll come back. It may, right? It, it was there before the dance, because we have records of it being there. 
Yeah, yeah right. There were certainly certainly areas that there's an old report uh, in the early 20th century that mapped some of these, mm -hmm. right? So it was there in the region for sure. But how abundant? It's hard to tell from those records. I guess you probably know more than anyone. Um, mm -hmm. Uh, so yeah, I think there are, um, it's interesting when you go up, um, up into the, the watershed above the dams, there's a recent uh, paper that just came out where uh, dippers and birds um, that are now, you actually can measure the, um, the marine nutrients and dippers upstream of the reservoir where the dams were now and whereas beforehand you could have, they, and, and you could, you know, below the dams. Um, so the new food sources entry, and it's interesting to think about what's going to happen to that ecosystem and all the communities, are we going to invite bears back into these fluvial corridors in greater populations, and this, what does that do to, I don't know, I mean this is something that I don't study, but I think, I think we will see changes, um, certainly. Um, and you're not even ready for that yet, because it hasn't stabilized yet. Oh, by no means, right? We just, that canyon, right, that, this summer, they finally blew up these, RV-sized rocks to allow, you know, the steelhead can make it through, but the Chinook and the Pinks especially were really struggling to get through there. So, um, um, they finally now have open passage. So this, yeah, it's a, it's a book about to be written. Yeah. You mentioned that there was a tribal member whose property got eroded. Yeah. Can you explain why that was when this is now a situation where you have so much deposition from yeah. all the block ups that have Yeah, sorry if that was a little unclear. So one of my first surveys, oh gosh, maybe my second or third survey was 2006, so before the dam removal occurred, I was out mapping the beach in my backpack, and uh, and this old guy comes up and goes, what the what, what are you doing out here? I'll, I'll, I'll paraphrase. <laughs> Uh, and I said, well, I'm monitoring, you know, and he said, oh, you damn site, all you do is monitor, damn it, and uh, <laughs> you don't do anything, get that damn damn out. And, you, know, I, you know, I'm here to study, I'm working with these people to try, and stuff. Well, and he's, and he's a settler of the tribe, and he says, uh, uh, after a few damnits and things and stuff, we, we start talking, and he goes, well, you know, my grandpa owned this, I got this land from my grandpa, and he used to have cows out here, right? And uh, you know, and he, we had a couple cows, and that was our milk source and all this. And he said it went mm, 200 yards out there, and I was like, come on, you know, I'm not. I didn't say that to him, but I was thinking, <laughs> I can't imagine 200 yards until I went to the the old photos and some of the maps and saw he was right. He was right. This guy had lost. So it was before the dam. So while well, the dams were in, that our understanding is that reduction in supply for this coastal system uh, with that. Um, think about, I talked quickly about the waves, the waves drawing that sediment and bringing it down shore towards the Eagles Hook. That continual sort of uh, loss of sediment because of that littoral transport just ate up that whole coastline. And that fellow lost basically his, his backyard, which was something he and his, his, uh, uh, his parents and grandparents lived off of. Um, he also told me a story about, you know, sorry, about climbing out on that beach. And I'm, and I'm, I'm looking at that beach, and I have to show you a photo. You know, wow, that big, right? No way. <laughs> There's no clams up there. I knew them. He's like, yeah, well, it's different. You know, it was, it was sand and mud. And he was right. And we would see out there now, it's sandy, muddy sediment. Yeah, so, um, anyway, that's what I was talking about. Sorry. It was before. Um, One more question. Uh, so now that you've got um, all the sediment supply coming out to the new delta, are you seeing evidence of vegetation, terrestrial vegetation springing up there, stabilizing those areas? That's a fantastic question. Yes, just beginning. And, and so one of the things that Melissa, uh, uh, who's working with these ecologists, has been struck by is that you have this new landform where you have estuarine processes restored, right? And we're measuring that. We see the salt and freshwater mixing and really fascinating. You see fish and stuff. Well, there's no vegetation. And so the temperatures are getting fairly high. It's, there's no sort of, there's not many, you know, vegetation when it falls in and provides these nooks and crannies and stuff that you guys all know much more about than I do. But um, um, we don't see that there. We are, this summer, you know, cottonwoods this big all over the place. Um, annuals and perennials starting all over the place. So it's just starting and it was really neat to sit out there on what used to be the beach that was eroding at two meters a year. I was sitting on that and you can see that you see that feature. It's very easy to, to stand on. And looking out 200 
50 meters, and there's the beach out there, the waves are breaking, and this whole land form here with all these little trees, and thinking, in 10 more years, I'm not gonna be able to see the beach, because it's gonna be this forest that's behind me. So that's gonna be fun to watch. But it's just starting. Um, and if you're interested in that kind of thing, there's a lot of crayon to cover and measure, so if anyone's doing <laughs> stuff, I can get hook you up, and you can do plant counts and all that kind of stuff. We need more folks like you. Um, so, anyone's interested in it, let me know. I need to plug in. All right. yeah. Thank you so much, John. Thank you.